This is Car Con Carne, episode 806. It's the last episode of 2022. That's it. We're going out with this one. Thank you for listening, watching, sharing, talking about, contributing to, just being part of Car Con Carne. This past year, we'll start right up again early next week. The last episode of the year is sponsored by 90 Days in the 90s. It's a book. It's a fiction novel. And I'm recording this on the 29th of December. It's the end of the year. New Year's Day, no one moves. Everyone's sedentary. Everyone is a sloth. If that is going to be your situation, your fate on New Year's Day, why not commit yourself to reading a cool book? 90 Days in the 90s goes right back to Chicago in the 90s. Fantastic era for music and pop culture. And it's a cool time travel story written by my friend Andy Fry. 90 Days in the 90s, you can get it on Amazon. Get it on Kindle so it's ready to go for New Year's Day. Or if you want to have it and hold it, order it through Amazon or get it get it from their website, 90daysinthe90s.com. So yeah, I'm James Van Ostel. It is episode 806. This is Car Con Carne, a podcast that usually is recorded in my car, but sometimes, especially during a holiday PTO kind of week, I reserve the right to record virtually. And tonight, my guests, we're going out with a bang for 2022. Vortis is back with a brand new collection of songs. It's called The Miasmic Years. It's another collection of songs that just kind of grabs you by the collar, gives you a little shake, then smacks you across the face just to make sure you're paying attention. This is raw, in your face, zero bullshit garage rock and roll. Vortis is my guest tonight. Hello, James. Hello. What I, an honor to be on with you again. Again. But I feel like such an asshole. We should have done this in the car. I like as I no. logged on to Zoom, I'm like, I don't want to do any more of these. I, I yeah. It, it's well, necessary. But I was I was I was giving Tony and Louie crap about not talking enough the last time we did this and they were sitting in your back seat and we had gone to uh uh the burrito house and mm -hmm. and they were just concerned about getting burrito juice all over your car we didn't want to stay in the back seat Couldn't oh focus. worst worst things have happened guys honestly <laughs> I've, I've had every every manner of cuisine and ethnic food consumed in my car what is the worst <laughs> stain you've had in the back seat <laughs> i've i've food had stain Thank you. Uh, I mean, I've had tomato sauce and gyro bits and onions, and it, it it's always fragrant when I go in my car the next morning. <laughs> but, but we are the politest band in punk rock, and we just felt guilt about messing up your car. I appreciate that. And I want to save the new release is the Miasmic Years. I want to save listeners a trip to Google or viewers, a trip to Google. Miasmic means characterized by an oppressive and unpleasant atmosphere. That sounds about right. Yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> nailed it. <laughs> you know, on Sound Opinions, uh, I have said this a million times, and I'm sure you have said it a million times, we have been uh, the beneficiaries of a wave of fantastic pandemic records. You know, uh, everybody's quarantined. Everybody's going out of their minds. And a lot of great art has been made. And, you know, we made the decision early on being three uh, responsible gents the, that were vaccinated as soon as every shot came available, yep. that we would continue writing and rehearsing. And it's the only thing that kept me sane. I can't yeah. speak for Tony. Yeah, no, we, we, we did. Absolutely. Well, I mean, for yeah, me, uh, yeah, it was funny because we were uh, we, we we started writing songs before um, the world ended, and um, they were already going that direction, which was funny. <laughs> I, for me, yeah, we, the, we, yeah. the the podcast kept me from losing my mind. It, that was my mm -hmm. touchstone. It just having that creative outlet. I mean, to your point, it's like, yeah. okay, the pandemic's here. What do we do? You guys would shed it and it came up with the miasmic gears. I did my podcast, Jim. You also had that outlet for yourself. Yeah, yeah, both sound opinions. And, you know, I wrote a piece early on that I'm really proud of for the New Yorker. Uh, like, uh, the world shut down around St. Patrick's Day. And I guess this ran in April or May about, you know, we rehearse and have for the last 15 years at Superior Street Studios, right? And, um, you know, there must be 200 rooms in that block long warehouse. And some of them have three or four bands, right? And to me, it's always been, 
the pulse of the Chicago music scene. You walk through on a Saturday at noon and there's a salsa band and there's death metal and there's, you know, post-punk and there's, you know, uh, hip hop. And that's always the weed coming out from under the door. (laughs) And it was silent, James, for a good year, year and a half. Uh, We were the only ones rehearsing you know, it was always a sad experience when we drive up there on spirit street and um yeah. there was no problem parking <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and uh, it's, it, it's a pain to park there for sure stuff, but it's like oh i guess no one's here again <laughs> yeah see i, I, I the whole the whole community went on lockdown and froze especially bands that weren't doing a project you know the only other band i ran into for a good year at Superior Street was Ganser, right? And they were making a fantastic album that just recently came out Mm -hmm. and they were struggling to keep their own sanity. And I think, uh, you know, thank goodness we had that outlet of the music, rehearsing, writing an album, taking our time and uh, eventually uh, recording with Dan Dietrich uh, in his basement. I think we were the last album he made there before he he moved. Um, So, uh, yeah. It's weird. I, I I feel like talking about anything that happened during the pandemic, during 2020, is something almost to just breeze by at this point. I, I feel like there's such a collective fatigue that people almost don't want to hear COVID 2020. Well, we were we were really conscious of not writing specifically about the time, but that's why it's the miasmic years. I mean, it's miasmic for a number of reasons. You know, <laughs> I mean, look at the caricature on the cover that yes. Tony's friend did. You know, and uh, I mean, we're we're falling into this black hole, and you know, some people uh, react with despair, and others uh, of our bent. Uh, rage against the dying of the light yeah well, and know, that's and, go ahead i'm saying no that and that's the thing is like when we were writing it like i said it, it didn't it, it, the, the album became a bit of a concept record of documenting everything that was going on we didn't actually intend it for that to be at all but then we realized kind of told a story because we were just writing about things that we just kept experiencing but like what jim said it's like the the themes don't end it's like you can read the play, um, which we did <laughs> over the <laughs> over the break. And um, these, these these guys things- these guys are so silly. You know, they have a book club. We 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 rehearse right, and then the two of them go to the bar and uh, and get stinking drunk midday Saturday and discuss the book they're reading, whether it's Camus or Dickens or I mean, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's well, enlightening it informs the music and this is yeah, where the I, rich ideas come from <laughs> I, I am proud of you guys so previously on Vortis uh, the last album was This Machine Kills Fascists and Woody Guthrie reference aside the fascists are still among us like you, you had to keep going forward with where you were last time yeah, I mean, again, like you just said, they're, they're still among us. And again, like that book, The Plague, is like one plague ends, another begins. It's like, you know, we, we are living through a history that we think, oh, it's so unique to us. No, there was there the Spanish influenza. There's going to be more plagues. There's going to be more fascists. There's going to be more, like, you know, who's the next boss? So um, we, we try to document it with an air of critique we, I, I've always said, we've always said, I think that, you know, we're never going to like necessarily convert everybody, but maybe we'll get more people to like think on our side or we'll get people at least galvanized to yeah. think that might already be here and think like, oh, I, I can speak up too. It so, doesn't end. It's, it's, it's a cycle. But it's, it's interesting you should mention the last album because I remember there was a point after the last album came out and after we had been touring for a while, not touring, but playing for a while. The beginning of one rehearsal, Jim sat down on the couch, we're all chatting, and Jim goes, fellas, wither Vortis, which was his way of saying, like, I thought he's like, are you saying the band's over? And I was like, <laughs> where do we go now? And I think the themes of what we talk about and perform and sing about, they're still relevant, and we still have lots of uh, material to deal with there. But uh, musically, we did take a, a bit of a, a different path this time with the addition of loops and uh, s- samples and stuff like that, and a lot more... I don't know a lot more variety in the in the songs, so it is a it's a the similar story but told in a new way. 
fair. Yeah, I, mean, I get I get I get dinged on my own podcast radio show whenever I bring up this name. But I brought you know. my uh, <laughs> I, I brought my deck of oblique strategies, you know, to the rehearsal space. And whenever we thought, well, that's exactly what Vortis would do for this bridge or this change or this solo, or I have no idea where this goes next, right? We would consult the oblique strategies and try to take um you know, I mean, famously, there is Eno's deck of cards that have this open-ended Zen advice, right? Is it finished? Can you, you know, remove everything you can, right? And keep what you don't think is necessary. Or, you know, the sound of dripping water. It'll just be something that open-ended. And um, so we tried to zig a lot on this record and go places we hadn't been before and part of that was uh you know i was recording analog synth loops and my buddy barry uh in utah uh was recording guitar noise and sometimes we'd take it and slow it down or speed it up and turn it backwards <laughs> and just play with it louis is now uh you know singing half the material uh playing bass and dealing with the looper you know it's the same one that uh, uh a lot of hipster guitarist folky art rock type people use you know um and uh you know they often lay down a line and then triple it and double it and you know uh and we're just uh hitting it uh to make chaos well, kind listen- of alan ravenstein and perubu or eno in roxy music and if you're playing Jim D. Regatta's bingo at home, make sure you check off Perubu and Brian Eno. Yeah, yeah, there, you <laughs> there you go. Yeah, we knocked those out early, and we, yeah, this well, interview is still going. No need to mention them again. No, uh, we still have to cover Wire, and maybe we'll maybe we'll hit that. Oh yeah, I mean, well we we can't, we can't get away from the Wire. Uh, you know, I so I, I'd seen Colin Newman. Uh, he came to town on vacation with his wife. They were traveling, uh, hitting a couple of U.S. cities. We had a splendid dinner, and we're you know catching up about the old times. That he brought me a copy of that. Uh, you know, there had been a bootleg of all the demos they made between chairs missing and one five four and they said well screw that this bootlegger right they put out their own version of it uh better quality and and better sound and so he brought me this vinyl uh all the way from the uk so i sent him the vinyl and you know they're uh yeah, they 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 they're moved past the punk rock into something that can only be described as wire so the only comment i don't even think i told you boys that he finally wrote back thanks for sending the album mono eh <laughs> That's all he said. That's yes, all he said. Away. Mono. Yes, it's, yes, it is in mono. Yes. Well, all right, let's let's go there. Is this album? Is your album in mono? Yeah. Yeah. We um, it's it's on Cave Tone again, and uh, Nancy Wallace is the one who runs Cave Tone, and she she really helped with a lot of the um, what do you call it, Jim? Engineering or uh, executive producing? Uh, executive notes, producing. Yeah. Um, she, we, 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 I mean, we recorded here in Chicago and again, it was during the pandemic. So everything was via phone calls and meetings like this. Mm-hmm. And, um, Nancy was giving us all sorts of suggestions, how to like, you know, tweak things with the, um, final productions. And, uh, one of the big things with Cape Town Records, they like to put stuff on mono and Nancy's like, man, I really wish the last record was a mono, maybe this one. And thinking about a lot of great records I've heard on mono, I'm like, well, that's not such a stupid idea. It's like, you know, yeah, people like the separation of sounds, all the fancy stuff, but um, mono is bombastic. So like, yeah, let's, let's, let's see how this sounds. And um, we, we did a whirl of it and like, damn, that sounds good. So yeah. Mono, monolithic. It's (laughs) mono (laughs) as in monolithic. That's exactly right. I mean, we're a trio augmented by some noise, right? Uh, samples and, and loops. And, uh, you know, Nancy has the most amazing years I've ever... Now, Dan Dietrich is no slouch. I mean, he teaches record engineer oh, yeah. in Columbia, and he's, he's you know, worked with the best, you know, <clears throat> Andrew Bird and Wilco, and, you know, people who actually play music as opposed to <laughs> us. You know, and Nancy would come back with, you know, if you just goose the 80 megahertz on the snare you know and we're like i don't know what the <laughs> hell that is right and dan is like i don't know why all right fine and then you know whatever she suggested would come out absolutely killer yeah so let's get into the album a little bit we t- briefly talked about the the flu the spanish flu from 1919 the 1919 influenza blues 
I are the COVID blues is an interpolation of the 1919 influenza blues. I had to Google this. I, I had no idea. Yeah. Uh, it, this is your take on something that was released a century ago. And I thought you could explain this because truly once I dug into this, listened to it, the original read the lyrics, my mind was blown by what you did here. That's so old Tony. Yeah. So you listen to the S.E. Jenkins version. Yeah. Oh, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, I, I don't know how I, I, I stumbled upon it, but um. I, I was blown away. It's, 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 it, for anyone you know, listening, it, yeah, yeah, S.C. Jenkins, 1919, Influenza Blues. It's a blues song written about the Spanish flu, the, the first one that came around. And it's, it's a blues song about it, and it's, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. And I was listening, and I'm listening to the lyrics she's singing. I'm like, this is the same thing. This is no <laughs> different. So um, we just took it, and we just kind of ramones it really changed very few of the lyrics because again it's it's the same story exactly as i was a being the two songs it was 1919 it was the year 2020 men and women were dying men and women feeling funny all the way to the exact same lines death was creeping all through the air and the groans of the rich sure was sad yeah those who do not remember the past are doomed to repeat it is that (laughs) Yeah, yeah, no, no. yeah. Last, last last album it was Orwell we were quoting. This <laughs> album it's Essie Jenkins. It's the same idea. I, I just I, that was a really cool pull, and I mean mm-hmm. that, that this is when liner notes come in so handy. The the lost art of cool liner notes and reading shit. Like once had I not had I just listened on Bandcamp, I might have missed that fact. And I, I opened yeah. up the record and I I dug into that. I just thought that was really inventive cool and also kind of sad and depressing knowing that a century later we've learned not much yeah Yeah, i mean again her her lyrics again like you said talking about kill the rich kill the poor i'm gonna kill more i mean nurses i mean it 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 was all there it it was it was kind of a no-brainer i just personally just fell in love with that song that she wrote and like well what can we do with this now and that was um that was one of the first lockdown songs i think we tackled yeah yeah we have to give a shout out i'm so Glad that you read the liner notes, uh, James, because uh, our good buddy Jamie over what's his company called? Leo Graphics. Oh, Leo Graphics oh, yeah. over on the on the northwest side here. Uh, you know he did the the cover and the the liner notes, and uh, you know great play because nobody you know it it doesn't make sense to have the record pressing. They're so over burdened to begin with all the pressing plants so uh anybody who's printing vinyl uh you can't get better work than leo graphics they do fantastic fantastic work okay yeah, so going yeah. going going back into the miasmic years what's the catchiest song on the album and why is it bastard <laughs> <laughs> that's louis that's a louis song i forget what band it, believe it or not it was a, a band jim you got you played on sound opinions couldn't remember their name but I, I remember listening to one snippet of one song that you played because you can only play snippets of it. I'm like, boy, that bass thing is cool. And I listened to it once. And then whatever vibe I gave me, I just picked up the bass and did something slappy on the bass. <laughs> I love you know, it. And, and Jim, are you playing a wood block on that? What, what's that noise I'm hearing in the percussion? Oh, yeah. it's, it's Well, it's a Latin percussion fake wood block because I break anything organic. <laughs> uh, I've had wood blocks made of wood and they don't last long. Uh, so it's it's one of those heavy duty plastic uh, Latin percussion that mounts on the bass drum rim. But uh, I will say lyrically, uh, I took I took, I was on a work trip in L.A. once and I was trying to write a song every morning before I had to do some work. And one of the songs I wrote had the line, it's a great day to be a bastard because I felt so bad about walking past a homeless person and not giving them money that morning. I was like, oh man, I'm a bastard. So there was a lot more to that song, that lyrics, but that's the one thing that we plucked from my song cycle in LA and said, let's build a song around that. It's a great day to be a bastard. Which is unusual. Usually we write the lyrics together. Yeah. I was you know, going to ask. And, and uh, But this was one that kind of came fully formed to Louis. I was going to ask that because you are all of like mine. This is, this is a movement you've created here. This is a sociopolitical statement i just kind of assumed that there was kind of a writer's room for every aspect of the songs you create well it, it's funny it's funny it's like i i mean yeah we, 
we 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 sometimes write songs on our own. Like like Louis Louis will come songs, and his are always the very ultra sarcastic, like almost too satirical. Yeah, satirical <laughs> songs, and it's it, which I'm always afraid are going to be misconstrued because you're always speaking from the opposite voice. I'm like, are they going to think we're the bad guys? Um, you know, I'll, I'll come up with stuff, but no, a lot of times it was just us sitting around and uh, a Vortis rehearsal is uh we'll get together we're sitting there drinking our coffee and then we'll start just talking about the new yorker we'll start talking about what we saw on the news like all right let's do a song about that let's 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 do something about that so um yeah it, it, there, there's a lot of just writing amongst us like just kind of going through literally what's in the headlines and okay there's the germ you, you mentioned earlier about how you connect with people and how you can, you know, bit by bit, bring people along for the ride. I've got to think with all the content that's out there flooding people's algorithms and social media platforms, it's got to be hard to find people who are, who you're not automatically preaching to it. it I feel like a band like Fortis is already preaching to the converted and the way algorithms are stacked against you and the way, just the way things work, it's hard to further your reach. Is that a fair assessment or i think it's a i mean definitely i mean um it is a definitely fair assessment but if, if if we're gonna do music you know one we're gonna write like literally music that we like to play and listen to and if we've got to yell something into a microphone well damn it it better be something that we believe in it's like um i i, I would feel stupid you know singing songs and just about like trivial stuff that just means nothing it's like you know if i if, we have all these watts of volume behind us. Um, well, well yeah, got kind of a meaning behind it, you know. But the other thing, James, is two of the three of us are teachers, and if you think uh, they're all converted out there, uh, I welcome you to either <laughs> of our classes. I mean, I, I just had two uh, giant lecture classes of 150 students each, right? So 300 students for music and media in Chicago. Tony teaches uh, at high school English. Um, yeah, we can't, I mean, it's very strange what uh, the current generation, really, I've been teaching long enough, Tony has too, that we're talking two generations, right? What they know and what they don't know. You know, I'll drop a name like Public Enemy and there's like blank stairs come back at me, you know, and it was like, Flava Flav, he was on TV, you know, and it was, oh, wasn't he one of the Beastie Boys? <laughs> so, you know, um, uh, not that we want to be, I mean, Michael, who started with us, the professor, uh, rest in wherever he is, um, you know, called it edutainment after KRS-One, <laughs> you know, uh, but I, I think, you know, part of the problem is right now people are only talking to people who are exactly on their wavelength, whether it's in the, you know, QAnon rabbit hole or, you know, us well-meaning, left-leaning, uh, you know, too old to be revolutionaries, but are down with it. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, we got to stop just talking to each other and try to talk to everybody. Well, it's it, it, that, Jim, I agree with everything you said. And also, it's, it's again, like you said, we're, we're, we're teachers. And like I tell my own students, it's um, we read to know we're not alone. And I I, I, I only hope, like, you know, anyone listening to these songs will, will realize, okay, but well, someone else is thinking the same thing. Someone else is believing the same thing. And it, it gives them, anyone, a little more power to know someone else is thinking the same way I do. And we, we hope we give people that, we give a little anthem, a little little fire. Um, they're like, yeah, okay, you know what? These ideas, no matter what I'm saying, they're, they're not wrong, they're not stupid. Um, this is good, this is how I should think. So I um, mean, let people know they're not alone, in their thoughts. Mm -hmm. Jim, you mentioned Michael, which rem reminded me of the fact that Vortis has been around for a while. I mean. Fortis has been around yeah. for, for decades. Is, yeah. it easy, is it easier to be an indie band with all the resources that are available now as opposed to when Vortis started? I'd say it's harder. Okay. I, I'd almost say it's harder. I, mean, I, I think a lot of people are, uh, are, are you know, doing the tech a lot better than we are, playing the algorithms a lot better than we are. 
Um, I, I think it was easier when there were um, there was less out there because there was there was less noise to uh, compete with, less noise to um, uh, uh, try to raise above with. And even um, back even when you guys started before I joined, even there was more little mini venues, even all age venues. Yeah, There's a lot yeah. more places mm -hmm. to play now. It's everything's closed down. You We've lost a lot places. of our favorite. Uh, dives, you know, Ronnie's and, uh, uh, you know, yeah, Township. Cows. Uh, cows. Fireside. Oh, <laughs> cows. We love there, cows. There's more places we play that are closed than places yeah. that are still open. Well, and, you know, New City, kind of on life support. Chicago Reader, kind of on life support. That that uh, uh, dead tree media infrastructure mm -hmm. that existed yeah, yeah. Again, it was two thousand, so twenty two now, almost twenty three years ago, uh, is gone. Um, but uh, but we persevere. <laughs> and, and you bring up a point. I, I tend to come back to. I, I feel like with the availability of everything and everything you could ever want to search for musically is out there. That's one thing, but the the lack of curation to me is more apparent now than ever. Mm -hmm knowing who those trusted voices are. I mean, Jim, I certainly count you as one as a music journalist, as a host of sound opinions, but who are those trusted voices? You don't, like you said, reader in new city, kind of on life support clubs that are de facto Chicago music venues, maybe not really there anymore. It, it's radio. Fuck radio. I, yeah. Those trusted curators are harder and harder to identify. And I think that makes it really tough for music fans to what we were talking about earlier break out of yeah, what they know you know they're still they're still out there i mean you know the razor and die show are hugely supportive of us and been playing like a different song every episode uh weekly you know and chirp is is great and uh uh you know you what you do is incredible um you know we have to be thankful for what we have and and you just have to search a little harder it's not like it's uh every trip to the jewel there's the reader box outside anymore you know and i mean you know 20 years ago if you didn't read the reader every week i mean you know what kind of a chicago culturally tuned in person were you i mean you, you, for real. you might as well you might as well have been living in schomburg you know um <laughs> So, uh, I mean, it's just different. Uh, there's different places and you have to dig a little harder. And again, people get stuck in that thing of falling into their silo of uh, only their like-minded, uh, you know, it's the goddamn Facebook mentality, you know, friends, you know, what shows up in your algorithm, you know, it's like, that's not the end all and be all. For real. I, I do want to mention the miasmic years on vinyl, it's the deal of the century on Bandcamp. I, I worry that you're not getting paid what you're worth. Uh, it's ten bucks for the vinyl on Bandcamp. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I don't know a whole, <laughs> I don't know a whole lot about the market. Great, about, you just started a row, James. <laughs> I, I I don't know a whole lot about the margins, but I feel like I mean you're a value at any price. But uh, I I just want to make sure you're getting paid what you're worth because it's yeah, a fantastic you know record. Yeah, James, you know what? We just want to sell them and get back what we put into it. That's all. It's like, we, you know, we all have jobs. It's like we, we are not making a, a living off the bands. Like we're, we're not going to like eat the dog if um, we don't sell X amount of records. Well, I might eat the dog. Um, we, we just want people to hear it. We just want we just want to share with people. We just want people to get in their hands and spin on their platters. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the break even point. I mean, yeah. Why worry about anything above that? That's fine. We we, we play a gig and uh, we we make money get gas back to Chicago, sell a few records. Okay, great, perfect, wonderful. Well, and well, I love so that. Yeah. I, I kind of figured that was the approach. Like, okay, this you don't you don't need to worry about paying the mortgage or rent on your record sales. You you I mean, this is bringing it to the people. And, and I it, I've yet to find vinyl sales thing. this cheap for a new record. It's a liberating thing because uh, again we we can we can speak our minds politically in these kinds of things and it might you know it might put us in a corner of what kind of music we do um but that's okay. We 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 can live with that. We 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 don't we 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 can say what we want to say and and get out a message we want to get out and not worry about okay well we got to sell a lot of records so we shouldn't be so political. We shouldn't say these things. We should um you know sing whatever I don't know what kind of stupid crap you you might sing about but it's like no we 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 can do what we do, um do it well do it right and um 
yeah, we, we just want to get get people listening. I, I totally that get it. Fugazi mentality, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally get it. Like, and I tell people who want to start podcasting all the time, if you're doing it as a revenue stream or a way to start generating big income, stop doing it. If you're doing it yeah. because you, you think what you have to say has value and because you want to share it, full speed ahead. But the, the second you start chasing money, for your art, it, it becomes a really dicey situation. And I, I assume that's where you're going with this. And that said, if someone is watching or listening, 10 bucks, talk about a low risk. If, if you're interested by what we're talking about here. I mean, I, I dream of finding more independent Chicago bands selling records for that much. I, I, I probably max out my debit card in no time flat. I mean, I love that you're doing that. Well, thanks. No, we appreciate that. And that's, um, I'm, that's what we're trying to do. And, and again, to what you're saying, it's like, you know, to, to people, to anyone, whether you're a musician or, or a podcast, if you're in for the money, you, you look at all the people that do terrible things on these venues. Like, again, my, my students turned me on to this guy, Adam something, who's the most misogynistic, horrible YouTuber in the world, making millions of dollars. Um, again, I don't remember the guy's name, but um, they, they brought it to my attention because we were talking about... Uh, some Russian literature and a bad character, but you you look at what people are doing for um, likes. It's right. disgusting. It is disgusting. Simply put, it is disgusting. So Vortis, the miasmic years is out. Um, this is going to end well. We're, we're wrapping up the interview. Uh, I didn't even talk about this. <laughs> gonna end well, uh, I, I guess we should talk about that. I, I'm going to go back on that. The election denial thing. And looking at the cover of the album, you, you had to address it. On this album, a yeah, I think that actually to... came together before January sixth and before yeah. the election denial. That did. I mean, you got to, you know, the the pressing delays and the uh, the general. Uh, I mean, we didn't have any deadline. I mean, it was the only thing. It was almost sad to be done with it because it was the project that was keeping us sane. <laughs> um, yeah, so a lot of this was prescient. You know, uh, this ain't gonna end well. Was written before that. Uh, I forget, you know, we we had heard that line somewhere and we just said, oh, man, that applies to everything right now. Just like Distanza Sociale, uh, Italian for social distancing, was written before, right, Tony? Before yeah. the you, social you, distancing. You, again, we, uh, like I said, we, we started our rehearsals. We just started drinking our coffee, talking about things. And Jim brought it. Hey, you guys got to see this. And it was when this weird pandemic was happening in Europe um, and all these people in Italy were getting sick and um, uh, Jim brings up, up this post of um, these people singing on rooftops mm. and and this term distance de sociale and like oh wow what's that mean social distancing um, at the time it hadn't hit here and yeah. we were just like well, that's kind of a cool punk rock term like social distancing get away from me that, that that's that's quirky let, let, let's and look at these cool Italians being inspired to overcoming adversity. That's neat. Let's write a song about that. And then how you many know, months it, later? Oh, social distancing. Oh, that's a thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you got to realize it, it's it's Tavano, Calvano, and De Regattas, right? <laughs> I mean, we are three greasy guineas. There's no <laughs> two of it. And there's something about uh, when when the Italian cities were first shutting down. Uh, there's a, there was this video on YouTube of this guy on a balcony singing opera, you know, to the small city. Uh, I think it was in the north, and and you know he was all alone, but the windows are open and, and people were hearing. And the power, I mean, you know, that is so freaking Italian. You know, the world is ending, and so we're gonna sing. <laughs> You know, and uh, uh, that affected all of us. So that's and that's exactly what we did with this album. I love it. The world is ending. What are we going to do? We're going to sing. <laughs> Adam Key, you know, shouting uh, and barely, uh, which is why there's a lyric sheet, because you can't hear that we're singing. <laughs> I love the lyric sheet. I love you guys. Fortis, next time we do this, we're doing this in a car. With food. With yeah, you know, why, why don't we do it on in Tony's backyard or Louis? I mean, these guys live across the street from each other, and in this right way, here. we can we can drip on the grass, yeah, and the dog <laughs> will eat anything that falls, and we don't have to be self conscious. Louis didn't talk much again, 
because you know, and I don't know. This time he doesn't have an excuse. Last okay. time he was deadly afraid of burrito on James's car. <laughs> Let's uh, Louis. We can let him off the hook. I mean, we talked about bastard. That was his moment to shine. Yeah, yeah. He he gets credit for that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, let's, uh, <laughs> let's we'll go in the backyard. We'll set up a camera, some microphones. Yeah, uh, we'll hang that, out. That'd be much more civilized than eating in the car. Right. Which isn't to say that my show isn't civilized. No, 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 no. It's just we feel guilty now. Next time, you know, I mean, we could have gone just three blocks uh, further past Burrito House was White Castle. That's I'm what aware. my son said. Now, my son, now that but is my you son know, said, White Castle, you can't White Castle. But you no, but you you have White Castle in the car, James, and it is in the car for nine the onion. months. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, it just it's it, it it every time you open the car door, it's blast of White Castle. Oh, I, and maybe you guys it. will appreciate this. Maybe you'll agree with me. White Castle to me is absolutely a post concert spot. The only oh, time yeah. I ever yeah. eat White Castle is after a show. Like on my it's way home. It's a post post coitus spot. It's post anything <laughs> spot. It's it's perfect. Oh, I was supposed to go there. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, Randy. I don't want right. to think about that. <laughs> I do. On that note. All right, Fortis, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, James. Thanks, James. We appreciate it.